So good evening. Uh, today we have another episode of uh, Epidemic Watch, and today for the uh, talk we have uh, an eminent speaker, Mohammad Niaz. Uh, Mohammad Niaz is uh, 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 an infectious disease specialist currently working at Kim's Health in Trivandrum. And he has been credited to uh, sort of working out the last Zika outbreak, which happened in Kerala. Uh, Mohammed did his uh, MBBS from SMCI Medical College in Karakonam and an MD in General Medicine from the Government Medical College, Calicut. Uh, further, he went to uh, do his DM in Infectious Diseases at Ames in New Delhi. He has multiple publications uh, on this aspect, including the paper which describes the Zika outbreak in, in Kerala and many more coming up on the clinical and epidemiological aspects of Zika. So today we will hear uh, from his experience on how he identified the cluster of Zika cases and how we went about doing the epidemiological and clinical analysis of the cluster of cases. Um, the, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinod. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to deliver this uh, topic. So basically, I'm going to talk about what we have experienced about Zika virus disease. Uh, as you all know, we had an outbreak in the Trivandrum district of Kerala, and we had a large number of cases and certain atypical manifestations which uh, have not been described in literature as well. So our experience. Started uh, in the month of April 2021. And we saw uh, a lot of undiagnosed fever with rash. So they came to the OPDs as well as we noticed a similar findings many, in many of our healthcare workers as well. Uh, in fact, these were self-limiting illnesses and uh, there was fever and macular uh, rash and arthralgia. Most of this fever very, very self-limiting kind of fever. And uh, it was healthcare workers who came to us most because uh, this was not something that often required a medical attention even. The fever subsided within a few days. And the macular, macular rash, even without any treatment, it also subsided by itself. Some of them had arthralgias predominantly involving the small joints of hand. So that point of time, like a febrile illness with rash coming to our uh, in our part of the world, we think of dengue, chikungunya, etc. Uh, investigations were done in some patients, all came negative. In fact, as the investigations were negative, we had sent for Zika virus PCR in April for two of our patients, but that also was negative. So in May 2021, there was an increase in the exanthematous fever, and this was when the second wave cases were a lot. And uh, that is the reason why this, we did not uh, see much of the cases in general public because many of the patients were not coming to the hospital for such mild illness. But definitely our healthcare workers they definitely come to us and they were coming to us with this particular kind of uh, uh, low grade fever, rash. And uh, when, uh, when we analyzed, we thought that like it was, uh, it was seemed to be clustering uh, in healthcare workers uh, working in a particular area. And uh, we thought that like this is something very contagious that is spread to respiratory route or contact. That is what we thought. And uh, we started an outbreak investigation. Though we had some cases in the outpatients as well, for ease of sample collection and follow-up, we thought that we will do the virological investigation in healthcare workers. After taking their consent, uh, we started this investigation. So our case definition was uh, any patient with the erythematous maculopapular rash, starting from the face and spreading to the trunk and upper limb, with or without fever, because not everybody had fever, and conjunctival condition, again, with or without conjunctival condition, with or without posterior cervical nephropathy and arthralgia. So duration from May 1st to May 21st, we had 19 healthcare workers who gave consent uh, for doing virological investigation, 18 females and one male, because most of them were nurses. And they were all young, median age was 24 years. And we collected the sample of all of these 19 healthcare workers on May 22. Now, uh, the two symptoms I have already told, it was a rash was the predominant symptom. So macropapular erythematous involving the face, upper limb and trink, uh, trunk. It was characteristically pruritic. It's not a, like it's very pruritic, uh, itchy or something. It was a mildly pruritic rash. And uh, without treatment or with treatment, this rash subsided in two to five days. I don't know if you can make out, it is a very faint kind of rash for the photograph to really show it. It's a mild maculopapular rash, erythematous, another patient, another patient. You can see the small rash, mild kind of rash in this patient. Again, 
Uh, some of them had involvement of the palms and soils as, as well. Now, uh, none of them actually complained of any red eye. And what, in fact, when we looked at them, 26% of patients had red eye. But this was not something that they were complaining of because it was very mild and it was non purulent It was not causing any pain or anything. It was just mildly the eyes were red. Uh, many, uh, did, in fact, ignored it. But on physical examination, we could find this. This was another patient. So other clinical features, fever, as I told, was mild and was present in only 68% of patients, myalgia 47%, arthralgia in 26% of patients, but dominantly involved in the small joints, and sore throat in 31, and headache in 50. Now, sore throat is something that again misled us. Again, we thought that this is something respiratory that we are not picking up. So we wanted to uh, uh, like investigate for a respiratory virus that is not usually picked up. Now, laboratory investigations were not done in all patients. In whomever it was done, the total counts were normal, the differential count was normal, except for one patient who had lymphocytosis. None of the patients had thrombocytopenia and liver enzymes were also normal. So initial investigations that was available in our uh, like city was a measles, uh, something where like, you have a maculopapular rash, posterior cervical lymphadenopathy and conjunctivitis. Measles and rubella was something that we definitely considered. But all of our healthcare workers were mandatory, uh, there is, it's uh, mandatory for them to get vaccinated when they join the hospital. So we thought it could be some kind of an attenuated measles or rubella, but we did PCR for three of them, it came negative. And measles and mumps, uh, IgM was also done uh, for three of the patients, this, that was also negative. Uh, Biofire film array respiratory panel, one of our patients consented for that. And in fact, we tested for all these viruses in this multiplex PCR that include adenovirus, various coronavirus, including the SARS-CoV-2, human metanuma virus, rhino, uh, influenza, para-influenza, and RSV. And some uh, bacteria, predominantly typical like chlamydia, mycoplasma, and bordetella, and this was also negative. Now then we contacted NIV Pune, and uh, we sent the samples to NIV Pune after contacting them. And uh, from there, they tested, uh, they tested the patients for measles and rubella again, the IgM were negative. Uh, all the serum samples were found to be positive for measles and rubella, IgG, except for one healthcare worker. It was not uh, surprising as all of them were vaccinated. And uh, all the samples were negative for measles and rubella molecular test by active PCR. Now, why NIV tested for these particularly? Because that was a history that we gave. We told them that this is some kind of a respiratory infection that we are suspecting. And uh, another test they done was another multiplex PCR called as FTD Neuro9 test. And uh, in that, uh, the three of the samples came positive for Epstein-Barr virus, that is EBV. Now, uh, is it uh, uh, EBV infection? An acute EBV infection presents usually like what is called as infectious mononucleosis. Now, this is not the typical presentation. It, they usually present this fever, sore throat and cervical lymphadenopathy, but they will have a typical lymphocytosis uh, in peripheral blood, which was not seen in this patient. So we were sure this is not EBV and rest of the patients were negative. And testing for EBV not always means an infection or a, the clinical symptom is due to EBV because EBV can remain latent in human tissues for a long time. And so we didn't consider it, it has very significant. Now, all the other samples were found to be negative for the other viruses that was tested, uh, which include enterovirus, paricovirus, herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster, adeno, HHV6 and 7, and parvovirus B19. They also did an next generation sequencing of the samples that were given, but uh, there was no organisms that were identified. Now, June 2021, we again had more cases from the community. And then we decided again uh, to send chikungunya PCR and Zika PCR for a private lab uh, near to us in Coimbatu. And all were negative then also. Now, in 29 June 2021, a 24 year old pregnant female from Toronto. 38 weeks of gestation presented with mild fever, maculopapular rash, conjunctival condition, and arthralgia. Again, uh, blood investigations were normal, IgM measles rubella were negative, chikungunya PCR was negative, and IgM chikungunya was also negative. And this time, we again sent the sample to the same private lab with the micro labs. And there, uh, Zika virus qualitative PCR was done to show Zika virus PCR positive and uh, with a low uh, viral load. So this was the first case of Zika virus uh, detected in Kerala. And uh, so at that point of time, this patient had very typical clinical features uh, as that of our, uh, similar to that of our healthcare workers, the 19 samples that we had sent to NIV Pune. We contacted NIV again, 
And I mean, this patient serum was also urine, sera and blood was also sent for an IV for confirmation of all were positive for Zika. So we went back to the all samples and Zika virus, RT-PCR was positive in 30. In one patient, urine RT-PCR was positive and blood and serum were negative. This is an important thing because in Zika virus, the persistence of RNA is more in the urine compared to blood or serum. Again, if you look, IgM Zika was positive in 10. And in one patient, IgM is positive while RT-PCR is negative. This is also important because uh, in Zika virus, the duration of viremia or viral persistence in tissues is very limited. And usually beyond two weeks, we will uh, not find the RNA in blood. That is the uh, importance of testing for uh, serologically. And once you cross two weeks, and even after one week, the sensitivity of the test, in fact, decreases in serum. So if you are suspecting Zika and you're not getting a PCR test positive, you should definitely test by serology. And that's what happened to us also. And there were a lot of cases that were already sent for Zika during April, May, and June. All of them came negative from the same lab because the viral load, it in fact, disappears from the serum very fast and the sensitivity in fact decreases even in the second week it's less and after the second week it's very it's almost impossible to find Zika uh, uh, in the blood or serum. Now uh, and we also did a genomic analysis of uh, the samples that we had sent them and it was found that these samples the, the genetic sequencing uh, found that the genomic sequence was almost 99 percent homologous to the Zika virus isolates from Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, uh, two uh, large outbreaks that had taken place previously. So uh, this uh, experience of which, uh, as uh, like we had published in Journal of Medical Virology in association with NIV Pune. Uh, now Zika virus, as you all know, this name for the virus comes from the forest from which it was discovered. That's the Ugandan uh, forest uh, called as the Zika forest. So this virus belongs to the flavivirus group and with the genus flavivirus, uh, it is a, a lipid envelope icosahedral non segmented positive sense RNA virus closely related to the dengue virus and transmitted by the same mosquito that is Aedes aegypti as well as Aedes albopictex uh, in some areas. Now, there has been many outbreaks, as I told you, that was first detected in Uganda and named there, and after that, there has been sporadic reports which from uh, different parts of Africa. And outside the African continent, a large outbreak was first. Uh, reported in Micronesia in 2007, and that is in uh, the Yap Islands in Micronesia. In 2013, there was another large outbreak in French Polynesia, another Pacific island, and uh, it came into the notice of all of us, and like, it becomes very uh, prominent news uh, during the uh, time of the Rio Olympics uh, in Brazil in 2015. And in India, uh, there has been uh, cases that were detected uh, during routine surveillance in asymptomatic patients in 2017 in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. But there was uh, large outbreaks of around 200 patients in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh in 2018. And after that, uh, Zika uh, reporting came uh, from Trivandra into last year. So this is it. Uh, so African, uh, I've already told where it was discovered and the major outbreaks in Yap Islands and French Polynesia in 2015 huge number of cases in South America in 2018, 283 uh, infections in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. Now, uh, the, to talk about the Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh outbreak, again, this was a mild kind of illness, as I mean, most of them. And in fact, there was a follow-up of whether microcephaly uh, occurred in these patients or whether there was an increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome in these areas. In fact, it was found that it was not there. The complications of the neurological manifestations of Zika uh, including the congenital Zika syndrome, there has not been an increase in such uh, cases uh, in areas where this outbreak has occurred. Perhaps it is because there are uh, lineage that is causing the uh, outbreaks in India is an Asian lineage. We have the African lineage and Asian lineage and uh, the infections that is the outbreaks that has occurred in India, both in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh as well as in Kerala, that is our outbreak, was due to the Asian lineage. Perhaps it is because of certain mutations, a particular mutation called as S139N, uh, which is required uh, for neurovalence was absent. This is not very conclusively proven, but that is that may be one of the reasons by which we are not seeing much of congenital Zika syndrome, microcephaly, or Guillain-Barre syndrome in our outbreaks in India. We hope it remains so. Now, Trivandrum, this is 2021. We had official count 
of around 83 cases at the end, but we believe that the cases are much, much more than uh, the official numbers. This is the Kaiser Zika Open Data Project by, uh, headed by Dr. Vinod himself. Uh, 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 if you can see the various part of random, uh, large number of cases were in fact uh, documented. Now, uh, transmission of Zika virus can occur through the bite of an infected mosquito, maternal fetal transmission, we are worried. Sex, including vaginal, anal, and oral, and blood product transmission and organ transplantation. Uh, so clinically, what differentiates Zika virus from dengue virus? Like, what, may, what should make us think of Zika virus in a case of fever, uh, febrile illness with rash? Now, the Zika virus fever is something that is much mild compared to that of dengue and uh, chikungunya, which can have high spiking fevers. And the systemic symptoms like headache is also relatively less in Zika virus. Now, the rash is something very prominent that you can get Zika in Zika. You can get the rash in chikungunya as well as dengue, but rash is almost always there uh, in Zika virus. And it is a kind of a pruritic rash. You can get pruritis in dengue and chikungunya also, but not always. A joint pain involving uh, small joints of hand. Now, joint pain is a predominant and typical manifestation of chikungunya, but can occur in Zika also, but not as severe as chikungunya. Muscle pain, and as I told you, muscle pain, headache, etc., are much, much lesser. The patients tend to be less sick. That is what we have found. Conjunctivitis can occur in dengue, can occur in chikungunya, but is much more prominent. There is uh, a non prolonged conjunctivitis, something that is prominent in, chicken, uh, in Zika virus. Platelet count is low in dengue, it's usually normal in chikungunya. Zika also is usually normal, and even if it is low, it's very, uh, uh, it's, it's almost like it's, it's usually above more than one lakh. We have seen a few cases of thrombocytopenia, but always more than one lakh. Now, the incubation period is around two to four days, and they have a symptom duration of two to seven days. And severe disease requiring hospitalization is uncommon, and the case fatality has been mentioned to be low. And the clinical manifestations occurs in 20 to 25 percentage of infected individuals. So this means that uh, uh, the number of cases actually that would have occurred in Trivandrum is much, much more than the 83 official figure that we know. Now the clinical symptoms I've already told could be low grade fever, a non prolonged conjunctivitis, arthralgia, and rash. And with every outbreak of Zika, there has been newer clinical symptoms that has been found out. Before 2007, it was a fever with rash alone. But conjunctivitis was first reported uh, in a 2007 gap outbreak. outbreak. Uh, in the 2013-15 French Polynesia outbreak, GBS, that is Guillain Barry syndrome, as well as meningoencephalitis, was first described as a clinical syndrome associated with Zika. And 2015 South American outbreak, congenital Zika syndrome was first described as a complication of uh, uh, Zika virus infection. Now, this is something that we are all worried about congenital Zika syndrome, especially microcephaly. Fortunately, until now, we don't have a large number of, I mean, we have not noticed an increase in microcephaly cases uh, in our uh, in hospital, and, or we don't have any such reports from other hospitals of Trivandrum district. We feel that, as I already told, this Asian lineage of Zika virus may not be uh, related or uh, may not be causing congenital, I mean, congenital Zika syndrome because it lacks a particular mutation that is associated with neurovirulence, and we hope it remains so. So the diagnosis, as I already told, in patients with symptoms less than two weeks, RT-PCR is recommended in serum, blood, and urine. You have to send serum, blood, as well as urine, because in urine, you have a higher chance of recovery, I mean, uh, if it, especially if the disease is of a longer duration, and urine has been found to have a better sensitivity compared to serum. And the positive result in RT-PCR established the diagnosis, and there's no further testing required. A negative test, however, does not rule out diagnostic testing. And in that case, you should definitely do a serology two weeks after the onset of symptoms. So this is kind of an algorithm. So if it's less than 14 days, send for NAT testing. If it is NAT is positive, Zika is confirmed. NAT, uh, that NAT means uh, uh, BCR. So Zika virus NAT uh, is negative, you do a serology. And if the serology is positive and IgM ELISA testing, what we have to know is that IgM ELISA testing for Zika can cross react with the antibodies of other flaviviruses like dengue, especially dengue is a virus which is very common. So in fact, to confirm it is due to Zika, you need a PRNT test. The PRNT test should uh, differentiate between uh, Zika as well as a dengue virus infection. So uh, that is the algorithm in which you have to follow for Zika virus uh, testing. 
So management, most of our patients uh, like they do not require much of a treatment. You may give some paracetamol for the fever if required. That's all that we have given to all of these. And all of these patients who are presented with fever, rash, and arthritis, they did not have uh, much of a uh, uh, complication. None of them required hospitalization as well. But uh, I want to present a, a cluster of patients uh, during the time of Zika outbreak who presented with severe myositis and rhabdomyolysis and uh, associated with high mortality. Uh, I'm not saying that this is definitely uh, linked with Zika, but we have found some association and I want to present it because those who are listening and whenever there is an outbreak in other parts of the world, we want this to be investigated. We definitely are trying to publish this part, but it's just to be published. Now, uh, we saw one patient who was 65 year old gentleman from Peru, Kada, it's a place in Trivandrum, presented with pain and, uh, in the upper and lower limb, with weakness of the limb. And on examination, both the upper and lower limbs with, uh, were edematous and the muscles showed intuition on palpation. This patient he also gave history of a rash two weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. He had taken the COVID shield vaccine eight weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. Lab investigation showed a total count which is 21,800. Uh, CRP was normal. Uh, the AST, if you can see, is high, that is 1219. Uh, his anti-DSDNA was positive, but he did not have other typical manifestations of SLE, and his myositis specific antibodies were negative. If you can see the C3 is a uh, low level, C4 is normal, the CPK is highly elevated. So this is a case of uh, my, uh, rhabdomyolysis. This patient did not have any history of any, uh, did not give any uh, history of any uh, severe exertion, uh, nor was uh, the patient on any uh, lipid lowering drugs like statics. Now, the biopsy of the patient was done which showed myofiber degeneration and focal atrophy uh, with foci of endomycial and perivascular lymphocyte infiltrates. Ten more cases of similar uh, clinical presentations uh, were noticed and were admitted to our hospital in July and August. Now, if you look at the distribution of these patients, they were from uh, various parts of Trivandrum district from Potan Koda, Karod, Peru, but all of these are uh, various uh, parts of the Trivandrum district. Uh, and clinical features, if you look at their age range between 20 to 65, nine males and two females. Most of them were previously healthy and without any comorbidities. Uh, none of them were on statins. None of them uh, had history of symptomatic COVID-19 infection. Six of them had received at least one dose of the COVID shield vaccine. One has received the, uh, the, uh, the co-vaccine, but Still, five of them has, uh, I mean, uh, four of them did not receive any vaccine. Okay, so it, uh, it is not vaccine related. Nine of these patients developed acute kidney injury and associated metabolic abnormalities. The CPK levels were very high. It ranged from 10,000 to 6 lakh in one patient. And the liver enzymes were very uh, elevated. Uh, the uh, aspartate transaminase definitely much, much more than ALD, uh, indicating a, a muscle origin of the enzymes. As I told you, one patient had anti-DSDNA positive and the uh, ANA was positive in the other. The rest, all of them had ANA and anti-DSDNA negative. We also did a myositis specific antibody testing in all of the patients. One patient had anti mi 2 antibody positive, but all of the rest of the uh, patients did not have uh, this particular antibody. Complement level C3 was low in four patients, seven to eight patients who were tested, but it was no, low normal in the rest of them. But Complement four was normal in all patients tested. So the muscle biopsy was done in six patients. The commonest finding was focal endomycel and perivascular lymphocytic infiltrates. It was not typical of inflammatory myopathy. So there was no lymphocytes, especially. What we saw was predominantly uh, myonecrosis, so the necrosis of the muscle. And if you can see, there are a number of histocytes uh, which has come to eat up the uh, necrosis muscle, the muscle debris. <coughs> so. Again, necros muscles, all these cells that you're seeing is predominantly uh, uh, histocytes or macrophages, which has come to phagocyte the damaged muscles. Apart from that, uh, we also did a hist uh, immunohistochemistry for CD4 cells and CD8 cells, which were both negative. So this is very atypical for an inflammatory myopathy, because usually in inflammatory myopathy, we expect a CD4 as well as CD8 uh, cell infiltrations, but that was not seen in these patients. Uh, again, uh, one of the patients also a kidney biopsy was done. If you look at kidney biopsy, you can see there is a pigment uh, nephropathy. There is a large as a pigment cast you can see in one of the tubules. There was a result of the acute kidney injury. There is a myoglobin that is secreted. 
a large amount. As I told, it, it, it uh, raised in lakhs. Some of the patients had uh, CPK levels in lakhs. So uh, it uh, led to myoglobinuria as well as uh, fibular injury leading to severe acute kidney injury. And uh, uh, so in, we did not know what was happening. What it was the only clinical symptom that like we were thinking was, but it could be an inflammatory myopathy, but the muscle biopsy were not suggested. Second possibility is that many of these patients had an antecedent history of fever associated with rash. Not all of them, around five of them had. So we thought it could be a viral illness triggering an inflammatory kind of process. That's why we treated them with immunosuppressants, including the prednisolone and immunoglobulin. <clears throat> but despite immunosuppression, renal replacement therapy and attempts to correct the metabolic abnormalities, <clears throat> six of our patients died. Now, what <coughs> was interesting was that all we at Kim's Hospital received patients from Kolam district <clears throat> as well as uh, uh, parts of Tamil Nadu as well. But all of these patients were in fact from Trivandrum. If you look at the graph of these patients on the left side, there was some overlapping with uh, the location of the Zika virus patients as well. So that is when we thought <coughs> that uh, Zika could be one reason because this is something that new, something uh, a new virus that has occurred to the district, and whether this could be an immune manifestation uh, of Zika. Now, again, virological investigation. So, we uh, 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 had six patients who were willing for virological investigation and we sent samples to NIV Pune. Now, four of these patients tested positive for ICM Zika by ELISA. Among the four, two tested. Uh, among the four tested, two were uh, positive for IGM uh, dengue by ELISA, while in the other two, the test was equivocal. Now, serological test has a lot of limitations in flavivirus infection, as I already told. They can be cross reactions. So, what does it mean? So, we did uh, a PRNT also. So, in an IV, uh, a PRNT test was also done, uh, which showed that the sera of uh, the four patients showed flavivirus was reacting neutralizing antibodies, which means that the uh, their uh, uh, the the PRNT titer was high for Zika, but it was high for dengue as well. So they couldn't differentiate it was dengue or Zika. This was cross reacting both, uh, both dengue as well as Zika. And the report was that uh, it is a cross reacting, reactive neutralizing antibodies against flavivirus. And they could not definitely say whether this is Zika or dengue or it's a co infection. But in one of our patients who had a severe rhabdomyolysis, and had uh, acute tubular necrosis and uh, CPK in six lives, in fact, succumb to the illness, his urine PCR came positive for Zika. Is it Zika associated myositis? This myalgia has been described as a common manifestation of Zika virus disease and seen in 40 to 60 percent of patients. However, myositis with rhabdomyolysis is a syndrome which has never been described in Zika to the best of our knowledge. And uh, there has been uh, preclinical studies uh, where in which uh, it was found in a human muscle cellular model that human primary myoblasts are susceptible to Zika virus infection, but while differentiated myotubes were resistant. So how do we explain the dengue serology? Is it a dengue super infection? Is it a co-infection? Is it an antibody mediated enhancement, which is well described in flavivirus infection? Uh, in fact, we don't have an answer for all these questions. We feel that more of a virological investigation is required. Uh, fortunately, with the end of the Zika virus cases, like in, uh, the number of cases dropped into random, uh, these cases also disappeared. For the last three months, we have not received any cases. And that is another reason. Like, it came with Zika, it went away with Zika. There was some evidence of serological positivity. One patient tested positive by nucleic acid testing. So which we believe that there is some definite association between Zika as well as Zika and, and this rhabdomyolysis cases. We don't know what is the contribution of dengue to this. In fact, whether dengue serology is just a cross-reactive serology or dengue co-infection or super infection is uh, causing uh, uh, some kind of uh, in, uh, like uh, a severe manifestation in the form of rhabdomyolysis. There is another preclinical study in rhesus macaque experimentally co-infected with Zika and dengue virus. And there was a significant increase in serum CPK levels, suggesting that co-infection is likely to cause acute muscle damage. So definitely there are preclinical studies which indicate that a co-infection uh, may be uh, associated with the very high CPK levels in myo, uh, muscle injury. So 
We do not want a premature conclusion. Uh, uh, closure. We agree that many questions remain. Uh, what we say is that uh, our experience points towards the possible association between Zika virus infection and severe myositis. Epidemiology, serology, and nucleic acid testing in one patient strengthen the possibility of an association, but we need further epidemiological and virological studies for confirmation of this link. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, uh, that is a really fantastic talk, which uh, actually gave an overview of the entire topic and your experiences handling the cluster of cases and, of course, the very unique clinical presentation of myositis that is sort of observed uh, in, in a subset of individuals. So there are indeed a, a, a number of questions uh, on different platforms. Uh, this is from uh, Prasad, where there are Zika cases without symptoms. I know, like as I have already told, uh, Zika cases, definitely there will be cases without symptoms because only 25% of cases of Zika virus disease, in fact, has symptoms. And we are not going to test them unless we do a serological study, uh, epidemiological study in the population, we will not be able to understand the true uh, I mean, number of cases that has occurred. So definitely there would have been a symptomatic case. Even symptomatic cases are very mild. They rarely come to the hospital. So from a clinician point of view, we are unlikely to pick up that, but that requires an epidemiological, a serological kind of study. Yeah, the second question from Prasad is, how was Zika virus not found in the whole genome sequencing of the sample? How many samples were sequenced? All right, again, uh, as I told, uh, like, uh, uh, like why was, there are two causes, why was Zika not uh, detected in the PCR itself initially? Uh, we had the same lab in which the uh, Zika virus testing was done, that is the PCR, uh, uh, like we had detected Zika first place. They also had missed, uh, like initially, because as I told you, the uh, virological test, like the RNA levels are very uh, kind of like it disappears in one or two weeks. That may be the reason we had missed it in the PCR initially. Why in the whole genome sequencing it was missed, the explanation that were given from NIA was that the viral load was in fact low. So that may be the reason. So it was a amount of uh, significant amount of viral load. Zika, uh, as we know, like the viral load may not be that great in the uh, like serum. And that may be the reason. And uh, the CT values were mostly more than around 31, if I understand. Yeah. Um, there's been another question. Can Zika virus be transmitted by breastfeeding? Uh, uh, to my understanding, no. It is usually the uh, like uh, things that I have told. Uh, it is uh, through uh, in, uh, uh, like mosquito bites, sexual contact, as well as blood transmission and outbreak transmission. Uh, yeah, so uh, I do have some questions. And one of the interesting uh, questions that have been sort of discussed in the area of Zika is, uh, of course, in, the, in this particular epidemic, you were fortunate to have been investigating the cluster very actively. While there have, of course, been many other cases which might have missed the detection. Uh, now, that is largely because of the training experience and the clinical insights you bring on the table as an infectious disease specialist. Now, how do we make this better uh, in, in, in probably the coming year? Uh, how, do, how, how do you enable more people to diagnose Zika? It's not Zika, like, uh, 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 like our problem is that like uh, as clinicians, we have a lot of differential diagnosis. It's Zika uh, comes, we have other virus species, we have undiagnosed encephalitis, etc. So what we want is that when we want to investigate for a particular, like especially viral diseases, we need a laboratory network, a laboratory which easily can be approached. We don't want to send the samples to NIV Pune. We want the testing to be done in Trivandrum, but we want sequencing facilities to be available in the state. Uh, so accessibility is the first problem. And for, for Zika, especially if you're asking the awareness of the clinicians, so like for the clinician side, awareness is important. So we have to make them aware of this as the clinical features of the disease, et cetera. But then again, if they're still there aware, how to send the samples, like where to send the samples, all these things are like, there is no clear understanding. The facilities are very limited and to go behind it like you have to go pursue it is like it's clinicians most of them will not have the time for it to go also it's a, it's, it's not a difficult you have to uh, do it all in on your own you have to take the samples you have to pack it you can send it 
So we need something uh, kind of a, a, an easy uh, accessible uh, to the laboratory that is uh, to test for unknown, like known as well as unknown viruses. Uh, we need uh, a setup which is available in the state, something kind of a state of the art virology institute, which we be, uh, I believe is coming up in the state. And uh, definitely PCR as well as sequencing uh, facilities which are available, which definitely as you uh, like, uh, who's involved in uh, a lot of these works, uh, I feel uh, Dr. Vinod can also definitely help the state, uh, which you are doing as well. So, so presently, where are the places the test, uh, where are the tests where the tests are available and uh, and where can these tests be sent at this moment, uh, at, at least point, at uh, least from Kerala? Yeah, at that point of time, uh, like uh, what I really said, like the testing facilities were arranged uh, in uh, Trivandrum Medical College as well as Public Health Lab in Trivandrum. And uh, there was facilities through which the samples can be sent through the DM, uh, the district medical officer in the East District. But testing specifically was available at Trivandrum as well as Calicut Medicology, if I understand correctly. And uh, now, like during the uh, outbreak, we also had procured the kits for PCR testing, and at Kimself also we have uh, the testing facilities for Zika virus infection as well. Now, if you are uh, uh, a private practitioner, there are private labs which are doing this test. Uh, I don't want to name any particular lab, but there are private labs which are doing. Uh, in fact, the first cases was diagnosed in a private lab. Right. Uh, and another interesting question that comes to my mind is, of course, uh, Kerala did identify the first cluster in the last year uh, in, in, in Trivandrum. And they were, of course, isolated cases in two other districts, uh, typically travelers who had come to the, the hotspot areas, either for investigation or for job or many other aspects. And there have been also other outbreaks that has happened, for example, uh, isolated ones in Maharashtra and a much larger outbreak in, in UP. Uh, have you seen the myositis uh, presentation in any of the other outbreaks uh, beyond Trivandrum? Uh, no. I mean, I have not come across any reports or like any like increase in myositis cases in that case, uh, like in these areas. Uh, but again, like, I mean, uh, there are like even we, I detected it as a, this myositis, the link between myositis and Zika much later. Uh, definitely, uh, we have informed like uh, the government as well as the National Institute uh, that uh, such a link, and they are also aware of that. So uh, I feel like uh, a few of my friends in that area whom I have inquired to, uh, like definitely there is, uh, they have not seen increase uh, in such cases. Then. But uh, like going through the literature, in fact, this was not uh, like dominated by Dr. Arvind from MCH to Vandor when we were discussing. Uh, whenever there was a Zika outbreak, uh, he just searched for myositis cases, uh, uh, increased undiagnosed myositis cases in that part of the world, like in different other parts of the world. So he found that there was an increase in cases, but they were mostly attributed to other diseases. So previously, uh, this myositis would have occurred, but whether it was linked to Zika, like maybe they could, like it was not tested, it was missed. And even like the problem with Zika is the process, like the sensitivity of PCR test is not very good. And to make it, uh, to make a connection between the myositis and Zika is not very easy because only in one patient, we also were able to detect the nucleic acid, uh, the genome. So uh, I, I have not come across that uh, kind of presentation. Right. So I think you have answered one of these upcoming questions from Shunil Srivastava. It is, uh, what were the differences in Kerala and Kanpur outbreaks? And how much is the gene diversity between the Indian and the Brazilian strains? No, uh, uh, like uh, I, I, what I understand is that like all the Indian outbreaks have the similar, almost similar genome. It's that, uh, like it was similar to the previous Rajasthan outbreak, is more than ninety nine percent homologous. Uh, so uh, the two outbreaks, uh, the Brazilian outbreaks, as I have told you, is, uh, uh, it has different and like a different lineage as African lineage. We have the Asian lineage. So there has been a genetic uh, difference, definitely. One of the mutations that they asked, I told you, like, if I remember, is like S139N mutation, which was linked to the neurovirulence was absent in our What percentage difference? I don't know. What exactly is a percentage kind of uh, difference in genomes? But uh, definitely, the uh, there is two lineages, and our lineage is, uh, is considered to be a, a lineage without much of a neurovirulence. So neurovirulence is important. Whether it is congenital Zika or GPS, it's, it's a nervous tissue which is predominantly involved in complications of Zika. So we had a different lineage. Yeah. And the question from Prasad has been, are there kits developed in India for testing Zika virus? 
I like the kits that were used in uh, Trivandrum. Uh, what I understand is a CDC triplet uh, triplex kit, which can uh, diagnose dengue, chikungunya, as well as Zika. So that was not developed in India. But whether ICMR has a separate kit for uh, uh, Zika virus disease, I'm not really sure of. Right, and uh, and of course, uh, before we close uh, this uh, session, there are not many more questions. Uh, uh, in the perspective of a common man, how can a common man suspect and go to a clinician suspecting Zika virus, especially because the disease is mild, uh, it's may not, many may not have much severe symptoms which will require clinical attention or even hospitalization. Uh, uh, from the common man perspective, how can we identify outbreaks of Zika much, much earlier? So it's mostly, uh, as I told you, the clinical presentation is kind of a, uh, a rash is the predominant thing. You have a maculopapular rash. And with that kind of a rash, uh, you get a fever. Uh, it's, it's a measles kind of rash and measles, you are very sick. You get fever, you have significant systemic symptoms. So uh, you have a, a good rash, a significant rash, which is pruritic. Uh, pruritus is one point which always should make you think of Zika. But you have much less systemic symptoms. You have a fever which lasts for one or two days and disappear without significant myalgias. And then you have a red eye, uh, red eye, but you don't have any other problems. The red eye is there, but you don't have any pain in the eye. You don't have any problems. So this triad, like a mild fever, a pruritic uh, rash, and mild conjunctivitis, uh, should definitely point uh, towards the possibility of Zika virus disease for both clinicians as well as the public. So it's Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niaz. Um, that was a fantastic talk over the last 45 odd minutes, and I'm sure uh, your talk will inspire a far more number of clinicians to investigate unknown outbreaks in Kerala and across the country. Uh, so thank you very much. As we close uh, the talk, we will also have our next talk uh, on 10th of, uh, 10th of April by Dr. Santosh Rajagopal on uh, the history of uh, mass oral polio vaccination. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you.